Hello everyone, my name is Andrea and today I'm going to walk you through a tiny part of the Rust VMM security journey. So for those of you who do not know about Rust VMM, I will just give a really quick intro because we don't have uh, a lot of time. So Rust VMM is a, uh, an open source project that is providing virtualization components written in Rust. The focus of this project is to provide high quality um, virtualization components, and sometimes this comes at the expense of features. We are also looking uh, at providing code and uh, components that are easy to extend and easy to use, and that is because we are serving a um, very, we are serving uh, different customers that have different needs. Uh, the main Rust VMM customers are uh, virtual machine monitors, uh, such as Cloud Hypervisor and Firecracker. Now, just to give you a few, few examples of uh, components that we are having in Rust VMM, um, we have we offer hypervisor support through um, the use uh, through uh, KVM IOCTLs and KVM bindings uh, crates, and recently added the uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Hyper V crates. We are also providing uh, implementation of de devices, and here we have a few cat categories. Um, so we have the uh, legacy devices, which are implemented in VM Super IO, and then we also offer some primitives uh, for working with devices such as the MMIO bus, PO bus, um, and device managers. Another uh, important part of uh, Rust VMM is the implementation of VertIO devices, and here again we have uh, primitives, if you wish, uh, in um, and these are the queues and the Vertio devices, um, but also we have device implementation uh, such as vhost user and vhost uh, user i2c um, and other um, primitives. These components are in various states. Some of them are already published. Uh, some of them are uh, in uh, implementation. So. Now with this uh, short intro, we can uh, just go back to the security story. Um, for us, security is very important and uh, we are trying to apply security at multiple levels, starting with the organization setup and ending up with operating in production. So now I'm just going to walk you through uh, these, uh, these levels, uh, these security levels and how we are applying them. In terms of organization setup, well, People have said it multiple times and I'm just going to say it again, but uh, well, we're called Rust VMM, so we're writing components in Rust. And actually this helps a lot because writing in Rust already eliminates complete uh, sets of uh, vulnerabilities from your code. Then uh, the other thing that we are doing is that we are, um, we offer one Rust package, which are called crates per component. Uh, this helps because customers of Rust VMM can import only what they need. So they can uh, reduce their code base by only importing the components that are actually needed. Another thing that we are doing is that all components run the same set of tests. We, are really want, we really want to make sure um, that all components are um, at the same um, level in terms of quality, and these tests include unit tests, build, and um, and linters. Something that is also part of the testing is auditing for security vulnerabilities in dependencies, but I just mentioned it as a separate thing because I just want to talk a bit more about it uh, as it is important. Auditing for security vulnerabilities is done through cargo audit. And um, how this cargo audit tool works is that it checks for vulnerabilities in dependencies of a component. Uh, to, to do this check, it checks a, well, check checks, <laughs> a uh, Rust vulnerability database. And whenever there is uh, a uh, vulnerability added there, you're going to be alerted when you're uh, running cargo audit. So there is a catch. We are running this at the Rust VMM level, but it is really important for customers of Rust VMM well, and uh, any other uh, people that are ri writing Rust code uh, to run these cargo audit checks in their products as well. Because Rust VMM is providing library components, which means that we do not 
actually fix the dependencies. These dependencies are only fixed when uh, releasing binaries. So again, it's really important for customers to also check for uh, vulnerabilities. In terms of development, uh, we applied a few things. So one of the things that we are looking for is to reduce, reduce the number of external dependencies. And this whole thing can start a long debate. Um, but let's just say that what we are trying to do is to use common dependencies that we can trust. So uh, most of the uh, RASPMM components have dependencies on a few crates. And these crates are uh, libc and uh, Cerdy. Uh, Cerdy is the serialization uh, and deserialization crate that is uh, widely used in Rust. Then we also have zero dependency components. And here, uh, there are a few examples of that. So we have a flattened device tree implementation that needs no, uh, that has no dependencies. Then uh, the crate that is providing implementation for legacy devices has no dependencies. And that's the same for a VM device, which is the crate that is providing, um, that is providing device abstractions, let's call them. So the uh, bus implementations and device managers and so on. Another thing that is important during development and uh, especially before declaring a component to be production ready is to add negative testing. And that is because we really want to check assumptions. So another thing that I would recommend people to do when they are consuming RASVMM and when well, they are consuming anything else is to run the unit test and the integration tests of the component that you want to consume because that's uh, a safe way to uh, check for assumptions that might not hold in your environment. And uh, thirdly, we are uh, trying to reduce uh, the usage of unsafe code. And again, this is an important topic, so let's just look a bit more in depth at this. It is like the path of risk resistance here is to just open a huge unsafe block and just write everything in it because it's easy. You don't have to check for anything and you don't have to actually go in depth and look at what uh, exactly is unsafe. We do not want to do that. What we do instead is that we are trying to limit the unsafe code and uh, make sure that we only open unsafe blocks where they are needed. Then another thing that is really important is to check the return of the unsafe code blocks where this is possible and document why the way that you are using this unsafe block code is actually safe. This one, uh, uh, this documentation really reduces the risk of being misused. And this is only one advantage. The second advantage is actually that when you're starting to write this documentation, you really figure it out and you really understand why this code is actually safe. And who knows, maybe you're going to get a surprise and realize that this code is actually not safe. Documentation is probably my favorite topic. So uh, one of the things that Trust does is that it is making you document unsafe public functions. So if you have a public function, you will need to add a safety section in which you document how uh, this function can be used safely and why this function function is unsafe. And something that we uh, added recently is threat model documentation. And this one is, uh, is particularly uh, important um, because with this threat model documentation, we are also, uh, we also find, found a way to document expectations from consumer products. So when writing the threat model documentation, uh, we did a few things. So what we did was to um, try to understand what is trusted and what is untrusted and identify the actors that are involved in a component. And then we also try to identify some threats and mitigations. And now I'm going to give you an example of how I wrote the uh, threat model documentation for the serial console. But in order to be able to do that, I will just have to quickly explain how uh, the serial console is implemented in Rise VMM. Um, but I will just let you know that this is overly simplified. So uh, we are 
implementing an overly simplified serial port with a 64 byte FIFO. And if we were to simplify the operational mode of the serial console, we would say that the serial console is just receiving and transmitting data. So now I have uh, here uh, three main areas of ownership. We have the VMM code, which has the ownership of the serial input and the serial output. Then we have the serial code, which uh, basically knows how to handle read and write operations. And uh, then we have the driver code, uh, which is just receiving and transmitting data. Uh, the host is considered trusted and the guest is considered untrusted. So for a read operation, um, how it would work is that um, the VMM would have a serial input and it will uh, forward this input from uh, the input from the serial uh, through uh, to the serial console uh, through the NQ bytes uh, method that is defined in serial console. And what happens in the implementation of the serial console is that uh, we take these bytes and we add them to the FIFO. And then this FIFO is consumed uh, whenever there are requests from the driver. Uh, for the write operation, how it happens is that the driver is just transmitting data in the serial console. We just uh, receive this request and we directly forward it to the serial output. So here we didn't actually implement the FIFO. We are just like writing directly to the serial output. So now you might already think about a few problems with this implementation. But before I start, I just wanted to uh, let you know that this uh, threat model is already available in uh, RASVMM uh, VM Super IO on GitHub. And that these uh, threats that we are talking about here are, are already fixed. So the first problem is that a malicious guest could generate large memory allocation by flooding the serial input. So this uh, already has a CV allocated. Um, and for this, we have two fixes. So first of all, uh, the serial input uh, can be forwarded to untrusted parties. So that is why uh, we consider this to be a uh, security vulnerability. And um, the problem is that we did not have a limit on this in FIFO. So this in FIFO could have grown um, unlimited. So the, the fix was relatively straightforward. What we did is that we, limit the, we limited the input uh, FIFO and we returned an error whenever the FIFO is full because um, this vulnerability also needs cooperation from the VMM because at the VMM level, we should check for FIFO full errors so that we don't get uh, spammed uh, with events from the serial input. A second uh, threat, uh, that we identify is uh, that a malicious guest can fill up the host disk by generating a high amount of data to be written to the serial output. So now if you remember the previous slides, uh, the serial output was in full control of the consumer. So in the serial console implementation, we didn't have a FIFO out or anything like that. So the mitigation is only possible at the VMM level. And here we are recommending the consumers of uh, VM Super IO to rate limit the output. And for that, uh, uh, you can uh, use a, a ring buffer because that has a fixed size and uh, uh, it will just uh, over overwrite uh, data or name pipe, which again has a fixed size. So there is no uh, opportunity for uh, unlimited growth. So how I imagine this presentation is going to look like is that uh, I'm going to come here and say I ran fuzzing and I discovered I don't know how many bugs. Uh, but actually, here I am telling you that I just basically looked at the code and discovered these bugs while looking at the code. Um, but there is an important lesson here, um, at least from my point of view. Um, so I read the uh, serial code multiple times, but didn't identify this problem from the beginning. But only when I actually get to read the code with security in mind, putting that uh, security hat on, I was able to uh, discover uh, these problems. Now, another uh, lesson for me was that uh, it's always important to follow the input and, um, and output and understand uh, what is trusted, what is trusted, and what are the side effects. In terms of uh, fuzzing virtualization components, here things um, are a bit more complicated. Uh, well, fuzzing other virtualization components. 
Um, so what we are trying to do, and I'm uh, going to be completely honest and tell you that continuous fuzzing is not yet implemented in RASVMM. Uh, what we're trying to do is do component-based fuzzing. And uh, this has a few advantages, but then also a few disadvantages. One of the advantage is that we are fuzzing library code. So it is relatively straightforward to pass the input from the fuzzer to the target interface. And then uh, these components can be tested in isolation. So you don't have to build a whole monster uh, to just test this tiny uh, component. Uh, the other advantage is that you can actually test directly the uh, low-level interface and you don't have to grow, uh, go through multiple other uh, higher levels. On the disadvantages, uh, the problem is with uh, the problem with low-level testing, this low-level testing is that uh, testing side effects uh, becomes harder because you only know uh, the effects of uh, of this particular component and not what happens uh, in the big picture. And another problem is that the issues that you want to identify might not reproduce in, for example, a VMM because maybe you actually don't uh, can't um, get that uh, malicious input. One of the challenges with uh, we try uh, with running fuzzing that we identified is uh, also that mocking the driver code is not really straightforward. So what we did so far is that we identified what are the target interfaces. And here uh, we have the queues and the device implementation. Uh, one of the first targets is the Vertio block uh, implementation. Um, and then what we did so far is we started uh, writing this framework, this mock-up framework uh, for Vertio devices. Uh, this was partially implemented as part of uh, Google Summer of Coding 2021. And what we already have available uh, uh, is a framework that can uh, create descriptor chains. And what is in, uh, uh, particularly important for, for fuzzing is the, is the ability to write arbitrary data in those descriptor chains that we are creating. Um, so next, uh, what we are looking at doing next is to create a specialized uh, mock framework for devices as well. But um, here we have to uh, pay a little bit of attention because we really need to find the correct balance between uh, uh, sending uh, random data from the father and useful data because we, we want to look at what coverage can we get with the uh, fuzzing, but also we do not want to send only valid data to the device because then we wouldn't call it fuzzing. And um, another thing that is important for us because as we have problems with fuzzing, the same problems are with testing, uh, just the normal behavior of devices. So. Uh, what we want to do is actually to reuse this uh, the, the mock framework. We are already doing that to reuse it in unit test, integration test. And we are also having some benchmark, benchmark tests where we are going to uh, reuse this mock framework. Another thing that is super important is reporting vulnerabilities. So uh, I'm saying this because uh, we are already operating RASVMM in production. There are multiple uh, VMMs that are using uh, uh, RASVMM in production. So if you find uh, a security vulnerability, uh, we would really want you to follow the security policy. All the uh, RASVMM components have a security policy attached. You can find this by going to the repository and then uh, dash security dash policy. So you have here a few examples. Um, now, if you're going to look at the policy uh, and the too long didn't read version of it is that you uh, will have to send an encrypted email to RASVMM maintainers and then we are going to work with you to um, assess the issue and uh, start an embargo if that is needed. I talked a lot, I know that, but uh, if uh, I want you to have three things from this presentation, this would be uh, that it is important to apply security at all levels from project setup to development and operation. Then uh, security vulnerabilities don't only get discovered by fuzzing. Uh, you could also discover them by reading the code and having a security hat on. And once you do that, it's really important to write that threat model and read threat models of the components that you are consuming. 
And the third thing, and uh, this one is really important, is that uh, please, uh, if you discover a security vulnerability in one of the Rasmia uh, components, use the security process for reporting them. Okay, so um, that is all. Uh, thank you for uh, joining this session. And if you have any questions, you can um, just contact me.